So we have already seen data transfer between the host and the device using QPy. And we have already run the CUDA kernels found inside QPy. So this time we will be writing our own CUDA kernel and execute it on the device. So on that note, make sure you have number installed. So you can do pip install number. And I already have it installed. In your case, it will take some time and install it. So once you have number installed, you can do from number import CUDA. With that, we will also get numpy and math module. So import numpy as np and import math. So let's create an array in our host. So I'll call this x underscore host which will be np dot ones. So this is a array filled up with ones and shape will be one dimensional array 65536. Now today our goal is to write and execute a simple kernel on the device. And this kernel will increment every value of this array by one. So let's write a host code which will be run by the python interpreter. So in this function I will take an array as an input and for i in range length of array. So I am not doing enumerate because in often cases zip data type is not supported in CUDA. That's why I have range then length. So from there I will access the ith element of that array and I will increment it by 1. And let's see the runtime for this function. So I'll do time it and host increment by one. Then I'll pass in x host. So let's execute all of this. So as you can see, on an average, 10.9 millisecond has been taken. Now we want to do the same functionality, but on the device. But there is a catch: the architecture of the device or the GPU is vastly different from that of the CPU. So in case of a CPU, the Python will be running on single thread and the array we have created from that data will be one by one fed to the thread and will get executed. This CPU thread is very fast running at around three to five gigahertz. But for a device, the scenario is completely different. So every GPU contains thousands if not millions of CUDA cores and these CUDA cores are arranged in a grid format. In every CUDA core, a single thread will be running and multiple of these threads will be grouped together which will be called block and multiple of these block will be grouped together once again to create our application space which will be called grid. So once we have this architecture, whatever kernel we write, a copy of that kernel will be passed into all of the threads individually. Now all of this thread has the access to the GPU memory. So it can directly get the memory and corresponding to whichever cell it is, it will get one or multiple data whichever way the kernel defines it. So once this data has been passed into every thread, all the threads will execute it at once and the data will be processed. So let's see how we have to modify our increment by one function to work on this device. So here is a program and it has the same functionality as the increment by one host function. But if you have noticed over here, we cannot find any for loop to go through the array. Instead, we have this tx which is thread id, ty which is block id and then block dimension we also have. So as I said previously, this kernel logic will be copied over to every CUDA kernel separately. So if we have an array of n length, we can have n many CUDA kernels and we can pass one element of the array to each CUDA core. That is how a sequential loop has been parallelized using CUDA. So over here, at first we are using a decorator called CUDA.JIT. So JIT stands for just-in-time compiler. Like Python is an interpreted language. By this point, you all should know this. But using JIT, we can actually compile Python code. And it will behave exactly same as program compiled by C, C++ or any other compiled language. 
So using JIT, we will compile this function only and send this as a kernel to the device. And once all the CUDA thread have this instruction set, we just need to give them the appropriate data. So inside the thread, we have to get the position of the thread itself. So every thread can be thought of its own application space. And in this application space, the thread is aware of its position in the grid. So we can calculate the position using CUDA.thread ID, CUDA.block ID and CUDA.block dimension. After calculating it, we have to get the corresponding data from the array and then we can modify the data itself. So let's actually write this and try to understand it. So first I'll use the decorator with just in time compiler. If you don't know what decorator is, I have a video in the Python beginner series. Go check it out. Let's define the function like a normal Python function. So after def, we have the name of the function and the array we want to pass it to it. Now comes the tricky part. We have to think it like from the point of view of the device. So this code, we have to write a sequential code, which will then be passed to the all the CUDA cores to be parallelized. So let's get the thread ID first. And next we'll get the block ID also. So once we have both of these, we need the block width. So which means number of threads per block. Now we have everything to calculate the position of the thread which will be dealing with a particular value of the array. So this equation will return the exact position of the thread. So if my grid is bigger than the array, we don't want to keep on calculating in the all cores. So for that, I have a boundary condition. And inside it, I can perform my sequential logic. And when this gets parallelized, this position will be different for each thread. And accordingly, all the values from this array will get incremented. So before we can call this function, we need some additional information to create this grid itself. So again, I have created a numpy array of ones on the host. And using CUDA.2 device method, I'm transferring this data to the device memory. So this line works exactly as array, which also sends data from host to the device. After that, I have to define threads per block. Over here, I have written 256. You can go with any number and I have to calculate blocks per grid. So once we have threads per block and blocks per grid, we can finally call this function. So to call this detect function on the GPU, we have to use the name of the function. And after that, inside square brackets, we have to first pass the blocks per grid and then the threads per block. So this is very important. This will actually create the grid itself. So without creating a grid, we cannot call a kernel function. So once the function and the grid both are ready, we can actually pass in the data itself. So make sure you are not passing a host data over here because for this kernel, this does not even know that host data exists. It only has access to the device data. So let's run this. CPU time took 15.6. This is the compilation time actually. And wall time took 127 ms. So actually what happened? This is not what we expected, right? This was actually very, very slower than the CPU execution. But if you run this again, you can see that this has significantly sped up. So if I do time it and run it, it only took 33 microseconds instead of 10 millisecond, which is like something around 1000 times faster. So what happened first time? As I said, in the first call of this function, we had to compile this function in binary and transfer it via PCI to the device. And also we had to create this grid itself. That's why it took so much time. But once this has been called, everything has been cached on the device itself. So once that is done, we can simply execute this and we can see the acceleration and it is by margin a lot faster than before. Now all of this calculation is actually a part of the CUDA module. So instead of manually calculating the position from thread ID and block ID, we can directly do position equals to CUDA dot grid. So inside that we have to give the dimension of the grid. 
and that's it and let's run it again it is working as expected also you can see the device data so for that i will do x device dot copy to host and i'll execute this so wait uh, what happened we can see 81112 right this is very interesting because as i said the cuda kernel does not return anything so we are in position actually modifying the values and what time it does time it actually runs it for multiple times so as many times it was run the data that was in the device actually got incremented every time by one so if we want to avoid this we actually have to recreate these ones and then i will just remove it the time it line and i'll run this and now if you see the array everything is 22222 because we started with np dot ones so every value of this array has increased by one so let's recap and see what are the things we did just now so first for the cpu we did a for loop so inside that for loop all the data of that array we went to every data one by one and incremented every data by plus one and this for loop was running on a single thread so first the zeroth element was incremented to 2 then the first element was incremented to 2 and so on and the nth element was incremented to 2 but in case of the device we first transferred the data to the device itself so all the array elements we have in the device now we have written a sequential code so in this code it is executed line by line and this is missing a for loop now after that we have created a grid with the desired size to increment everything from this array so the sequential logic we wrote it will first get the thread id and after that it will get the corresponding data that it has to work on using that id so from thread id we will get position and from position we will get the element of the array so once we have this element we can actually execute this thread so all of this thread did the same thing simultaneously and this increment by one operation was done together in a parallel way that's how we achieved acceleration now this was a simple enough example for one dimensional data let's work with two dimensional data on this same logic so i will create some data on the device and over here i will pass shape as a 2d matrix now it's time to write the kernel itself so i will use the jit decorator so at the it kuda dot jit then name of the function once i have everything the data on this device has the dimension of 2 so what we can do we can get the thread position in two dimensional form so i can do x comma y equals to kuda dot grid then i have to pass 2 over here now i'll just do the boundary condition and i'll just update the value of that array for this position and that's it so let's calculate blocks per grid and threads per block so we can write our own custom threads per block which i am writing over here 16 comma 16 and from there we'll get blocks per grid for the x and y dimensions so blocks per grid then we'll do ceiling so shape 0 divided by threads per block 0 which is 16 over here and similarly blocks per grid for y dimension we can do the same thing but with shape 1 and lastly we can define blocks per grid as this tuple now it's time to call this function so i'll time it and call the 2d increment function and i'll pass blocks per grid and threads per block 
with that i will also pass the device data that we have created previously so let's execute everything and as you can see this was also fairly fast if you see 32.1 microsecond which is exactly as the 32.7 microsecond because we have enough CUDA cores to handle this 2D operations also. So every data of this two dimensional array also was passed to single thread and everything was calculated at once. So this is how you can work with 2D arrays using the JIT decorator. So this is not limited to the shape of the array or anything else. You can have a two dimensional array while your thread plot block can be a one dimension and for every kernel you are working on one nested array itself. So previously we used QPy to handle arrays. We can actually use QPy arrays with this number decorator because QPy implementation of array is also based on the CUDA toolkit provided by NVIDIA. So number can convert the QPy array to the number array. So let's import QPy. And I'll create the QPy array and pass it to the kernel which we have created using number. So if you run this, everything worked fine. And let's see the device and the array type. So although this kernel worked on this QPy array, it did not change the type of this array. So our array is still QPy.nd array. And yeah. And the result is as expected. So everywhere we have two. Now this example was very simple, but it may feel very different from how you are used to writing program in Python. So to write a CUDA kernel, we have to think from the perspective of the GPU itself. Loops are something we don't need inside the GPU because it has so many parallel cores. Every core can handle a singular data at a time. So we have to modify our programs to work like that. And so once we have done that, we can access the data inside the GPU and every kernel can do their job simultaneously. So next time we will try to write a bit more complicated kernels for CUDA. So as a practice challenge, I want you guys to implement square matrix multiplication on CUDA. And in the comment section, you can write your GTET function. So looking forward to your answers. See you next time. Thank you for watching this video. Thumbs if you liked it. Do share it with your friends and family and make sure to subscribe for more content and let me know in the comment section below.